from our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans. Welcome to our Louisiana Eats podcast series, Quick Bites. I'm Poppy Tooker. Have you ever heard of Aura King Salmon? If you've caught our two most recent Quick Bites, you have. I was chosen to be the 2018 Aura King competition judge, so in recent weeks, We've met the first two Aura King Salmon finalists, Maya Lee from Lenoir in Austin, Texas, and Yael Pete from Karasu in Brooklyn, New York. If you're still a stranger to Aura King, it's a sustainably raised salmon from New Zealand whose story is almost as delicious as the fish itself. Back in early 1900, two avid fishermen somehow managed to bring live king salmon home to New Zealand from a fishing trip to California. It turns out the salmon love it there, and the rest is Aura King history. Aura King is only available to the restaurant trade, where it's developed a cult following with top chefs like Thomas Keller and Emeril Lagasse because of its pristine quality and flavor. On today's podcast, we visit finalist number three, Jonathan Granada of Otium in Los Angeles, where he serves as chef de cuisine under executive chef Timothy Hollingsworth. Jonathan caught Timothy's attention during the years he worked his way up from Comey to line cook at Thomas Keller's famed French Laundry in Napa Valley. Timothy tapped Jonathan to be chef de cuisine when he opened Otium, a fine dining establishment with a casual atmosphere connected to the Broad Museum in downtown Los Angeles. I was a bit apprehensive going into the third tasting of my judging assignment. You see, the paperwork I received from Aura King listed five dishes instead of the single dish I judged from each of the previous contestants. Despite the disparity, I was instructed to judge the five dishes as one using a 110-point scoring system. Entering the airy, beautiful space that Otium occupies, I found Jonathan intensely preparing for his salmon marathon. He began by showing me the piece of art which inspired his dishes. He'd had a friend help construct a collage of photos from the lives of Anthony Bourdain and Paul Bocuse, whose lives and work have been a career-long inspiration to Jonathan. Here's what he had to say. And honestly, the, the idea for this dish came to me within 10 minutes, because the first thing that I thought of when I heard art, and everybody thinks maybe music, poetry, things like that, but... Mine was my career, the career, culinary, you know, people like that. So, I mean, it, it's an artistic form in its own and what people have done. I mean, we have to eat every day. And so when I thought of art and culinary, I immediately remembered, I mean, because it wasn't that long after they had said the inspiration should be art, that Anthony Bourdain had passed and then Paul Bocuse for that. Um, so I decided to use me being chef de cuisine of a restaurant and being able to honestly kind of do what I want to pay homage to these two legends that have done so much for not only the culinary career but I mean Anthony Bourdain touched a lot of lives that people don't even cook you know Anthony Bourdain had a lot of people that I mean if you had social media and you went onto Instagram after Anthony Bourdain passed away I mean everybody was posting about it not even being in the industry so I decided to take two pictures of Anthony Bourdain two pictures of Paul Bocuse and one of both of them to kind of create a roadmap of my career. Now, every story is true, and all of this is completely heartful. It, I'm not bullshitting anybody when I came up with this. Um, it just honestly just so happened to fall into place, and it was honestly an eye-opening thing when I was kind of mapping it out, and I was like, wow, this is like, they really had a big influence on my career. So the first picture I started with was of Anthony Bourdain smoking a cigarette. Everybody knows he was big on smoking cigarettes. And one of the, 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 the reason I wanted to go to the French Laundry was I saw the YouTube video of Anthony Bourdain going to eat at the French Laundry and Thomas Keller canceling out his cigarette break to make him a marble red custard so he wouldn't have to leave his table. And I thought that was the coolest thing, the attention to detail, the, just the creativity of it. And when you watch the video, he immediately blushes when they tell him that. And he's like, oh my God, this is so amazing. You look like a little kid, like, this is so cool. I'm so embarrassed, but wow. You know, and it was just that me going, man, I want to go work there. That's so cool. I want to think like that. 
So actually, it was that little glimpse of the French Laundry that you got through Anthony Bourdain's eyes that actually led you to aspire to work there. Absolutely. That's 100% correct. So I created the dish that was kind of not nowhere near better than Thomas Keller's, and I would never try to compete against that. But I wanted to do something also inspired off of tobacco. So I did the uh, confit salmon with tobacco leaf, and then I smoked plantain puree with tobacco leaves, filled it with Frito brick, and then did uh, burnt onion ash with it. It, it. it was remarkable. I have to admit, I had a little trepidation because I was a little worried about the <laughs> tobacco thing and how it might work or not work but you nailed it it was really it was beautiful and it was delicious but that wasn't all then what happened now after knowing i wanted to go to the french laundry and thinking about cooking now the next step was being in culinary school and then everybody talking about anthony bourdain and now i started looking up more pictures of him and there's this one iconic picture that's set with me of him and that's him pulling the, the, the wine cork out of a bottle of wine with his teeth while he's holding a saute pan in the, in the air. And I remember being in culinary school, everybody thought it was cool to pour wine and set it on fire. And, oh, my God, look at me. I'm cooking with fire. Um, even though that's not the case nowadays. It's not actually good. It actually tastes kind of gross. Um, <laughs> not gross. If that's the wrong word. But, yeah, you know, it's, 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 there's a better way to do it. Um, but it was that picture that, that, that made me... That, that, that made me want to like, like, like to create this dish. And uh, so I used that, that wine and I created a dish with Beurre Rouge, which is a red wine butter sauce. And then I took uh, Orking Salmon Belly and confit it to make it very soft and, and just like very, very textural. And then did over the top, because the, the salmon was soft, I did raw cauliflower florets, dried niçois olive, frisé tarragon, and fried potato. And then I served it with a cauliflower puree that was really thick and just made with nothing but butter and cream. Um, and that dish was to pay homage to uh, a picture that kind of makes me think of Anthony Bourdain every time I see it. <laughs> butter and cream, two of my favorite words. But that was not enough. There's more. So now I made myself to the French Laundry and I'm staging there. And uh, my first day staging at the French Laundry, I got absolutely murdered. And it was just in over my head. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into or the level of talent that was there. So after my first stage, I decided to go see a movie and kind of clear my head. And Ratatouille was out at this moment, the movie Ratatouille. And I loved the movie. And so I went and saw it. When I came in the next day, I kind of went up to a couple of the cooks to try to break the ice. And I was like, hey, have you guys seen the movie Ratatouille? Hey, isn't it cool? Little did I know that Pixar had come to the French Laundry and put the cooks in these suits to help mimic the movements of the chef. And the chef Gusteau is actually based off Paul Bocuse. And if you look it up, you'll see you know pictures of Ratatouille with Paul Bocuse. And it was just it was a cool connection of, of the movie and the French Laundry and then the you know the dish. And then once I started working there, we would make it once a year. And then it became a tradition of mine where I make it once a year just because I love it. It takes a lot of time. It's very heartful and soulful, so I would go buy everything at home, and I'd make it at home every year, and then I would also make it at the restaurant and serve it. So when I was thinking about dishes that I would do for Paul Bocuse, that was a no-brainer to do ratatouille. But the way I did it with the salmon was when we would serve it at the French Laundry, the natural, uh, like what we would serve it with would be a lamb chop ratatouille, lamb jus, uh, croutons, and basil. Of course, that's what everyone would expect, lamb. I don't know that anyone has seen a salmon chop before. What the heck is that? <laughs> so I learned that at the French Laundry. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a cut of the salmon made off of the back of the neck. So the back of the neck and using the collarbone of the salmon, uh, took it off, boned it out, tied it up just like a lamb chop, roasted it in a pan just like a lamb chop, and then served it with the ratatouille and breadcrumbs. But I also took some of the skin from different parts of the fish and made a chicharron with it for more texture to off-balance the softness of the ratatouille. And then? <laughs> and then um, another dish I really wanted to do to pay homage to Paul Bocuse is his uh, poulard and vessi that he does um, at his restaurant in Lyon, France, where a vessi is a pig's bladder. And I know that sounds gross, but they clean it. And it's honestly it's just a way of infusing like pig flavor into something. It's just like when your mom does... Uh, uh, a turkey for Thanksgiving and puts the turkey inside the bag. It's the same thing. You're just putting something in a bag to help braise it and cook it and infuse flavor. But this is using an animal part rather than plastic. Uh, and so 
I used a picture of Paul Boku showing his uh, chicken tattoo, which I thought was really, really cool. So I used that to kind of tie in the chicken and the vessi. But since salmon can overcook and salmon's not chicken, I decided to use a different part of the salmon that could be cooked like that. So I took the tail part of the salmon and uh, French the bone and took the skin off. And then to add more meat to the fish and more fat to the salmon that's already fatty, I uh, covered it in truffles, wrapped it in call fat, and then stuck it in a bag with a salmon jus that I used by smoking the bones in our grill at Odium. And then put inside the bag carrots, mushrooms, and more truffles. That was a real showstopper. That beautiful, beautiful balloon of deliciousness. It opens, it goes on the plate, and gosh, who ever knew that a salmon could resemble maybe an osabuco? <laughs> yeah, it's very, very cool. I liked it a lot. We've done it a few times at Odium. I, I, I really like that presentation a lot. I love the smell, especially, and the guests, they... The guests really, really love it. It's not, it's not easy to do. It's very, very technical because the vessies that you get, they sometimes bust open. You take it to a table and God forbid it bust, it like, like explodes all over somebody's nice clothes. So you're kind of taking a risk when you do it and you got to make sure you, 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 you make your distance when you do it. But if you can, it's very technical and it's well worth it. I will attest to that. But what surprised me was that there was one more dish. That was always a surprise each time. But this last dish was one that you were kind of nervous about. Yeah, this last dish, uh, I decided to pull out a lot, like the most technique that I've ever done, um, to really challenge myself and to just give it a shot and see if it works across the fingers. Um, and so the centerpiece to this to this dish was when I did my research, I found that Anthony Bourdain and Paul Bocuse had shared a dinner at, at Bocuse Restaurant in Lyon, France, uh, right before they both passed away. And amongst a ton of iconic and amazing dishes that Paul Bocuse has, one of which was a whole bass and puff pastry. So it kind of felt perfect, like, oh, my God, fish, puff pastry, Paul Bocuse, you know, Anthony Bourdain, this is perfect. So I had to manipulate a fish because I can't cook a whole 15 pound or king salmon in puff pastry It'd be very difficult and would take a long time and be very expensive so I had to use the shape of a small fish and then I carved out uh, a shape of the salmon loin but I split it into two pieces and filled the middle with a scallop and truffle mousse so that it would be even on the top layer the middle mousse and the bottom layer and then to get the puff pastry around it and to get the salmon inside of it and then to get it to cook and the puff pastry to be crispy and the salmon to be cooked and not overcooked on the inside and the scallop to be uh, cooked but not overcooked was very, very technical. It was a lot of resting and egg washing and freezing and then cooking and then resting and then carving and then rewarming. It was very, very technical, but it came out. I was happy with it. I, I was there when you cut it open and uh, everybody, there was a little excitement in the air because it could have been a fail, but... It was kind of perfect. <laughs> what was the sauce? So the sauce, when I when I did my re research, what Paul Bocuse does is the sauce was um, sauce Chiron. And so sauce Chiron is basically a hollandaise with uh, tomato in it. And um, when I used to make it at the French Laundry, we'd do a little Tabasco in it. So I took tomatoes and I roasted them in our wood oven at Odium. And then when I came out, I tossed them in fresh tarragon and then blended them with a RoboCoop so they wouldn't turn pink, so they would still stay red. And then I would make, and then I made my Savillon or my Hollandaise with my Bernays reduction or my tarragon. And then I would whip in my uh, tomato puree into that. And then to make sure that it wouldn't form a skin and that it would be perfect consistency, I put that then into an ISI gun. And then that way I would get the consistency I wanted and it wouldn't form a skin and it would stay consistent every time. Let's talk about your relationship with the salmon. Now, <laughs> we're sitting here together because of the salmon. So how did you and the salmon create this bond together? Because obviously the two of you are very good friends. <laughs> the salmon's a star, not me. I just make it look good. Um... I actually had a cook. It was a cook that had brought up. I had a dish in mind that I wanted to do. And I couldn't figure out how I wanted to tie it all together. And then one of my cooks goes, oh, what about Ori King Salmon? I was like, I've never heard of Ori King Salmon. What's that? 
And he was like, oh, yeah, everybody's using it now. And uh, I mean, as you know, it's not hasn't been around too, too long. So I was like, oh, this is cool. So I called up my New Zealand fish purveyor, Antoinette, and uh, ordered Nora King salmon and immediately fell in love with it. Uh, and then, yeah, one of my sous chefs had told me about an Nora King salmon competition. And so I took the dish that I had already had on the menu and decided to just submit it just with the fingers crossed, not thinking anything of it, just like a sure, why not? Let's see what happens. Like, why not? And then <laughs> fast forward a year, it's like, it's crazy. And here I am. But I, I mean, it really is the product. Like, it could be all the cool things that everybody does with it. But it's just a really amazing product. What sets it apart from other high quality wild salmon, etc.? What is different to you about this kind of fish? The fat content, the flavor, the utilization of every part of the fish, the family behind it. I mean the, the I mean the family alone, the owner, the, the purveyors from the United States, New Zealand, Australia. I mean they're all just as passionate about this salmon as we are. They all love it just as much as we do, and uh, that helps a lot when you when you want to work with it. When somebody's like, "Oh, how'd you like that salmon? I saw what you did with it. That's so amazing. That looked so good. I can't wait to try it." Hey, how's it going? I saw you did this. How's this going? And it didn't even have to be about the salmon. I and mean, they're just calling to see how you're doing. It's really amazing. Um, and the salmon alone, I mean, just the the the, the skin. I've used the skin for chicharron tacos. I've taken the skin off of the salmon and because of how fatty it is. I kind of resemble it to pork skin. And dehydrated it, fried it, made it into chicharrones, and turned chicharron tacos for Taco Tuesday at Odium. The heads, we've saved the heads, and, and you know, it, LA being as like diverse as it is, uh, did Korean fish head soup with the heads, took the tail, did like an asabuco with bagna cotta and fried parmesan chips. Like it's very, 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 very well used. Last year, you competed, and you were one of the finalists from America. What was your dish last year? The dish that I did last year was a uh, Vidalia onion panna cotta um, with a Vidalia onion paquet or like a Vidalia onion consomme over the top gelée to kind of cap it. And then I did a pistachio nuage out of the ISI done, like a pistachio foam, uh, a pistachio nougatine, uh, scallions, chai blossoms, and then Ora King salmon that I crusted one side in uh, pu- pulverized uh, nori. My goodness. Well, that does sound delicious enough to get you a ticket to Japan. What was your experience like there in Japan at the Ora King Finals? Uh, it was very inspirational. I'd always wanted to go to Japan, and they really set up quite the trip. I mean, we did. We made soy sauce, uh, ate fugu, uh, did Japanese whiskey tastings. Um, we stayed at the most beautiful hotels. Uh, one of which where when you walked in, you had to take off your shoes and put on these wooden shoes. You had to wear kimonos when you went to dinner. I mean, they really, really did an excellent job at setting up the trip for all these people. And I, one of the most inspirational things that, that I saw in Japan was when we went to go make soy sauce because the soy sauce place, they, they made their own tofu. And... I immediately put this dish on the menu right when I got back to OTM and I was looking around the room when we were trying it and I was seeing if anybody was thinking what I was thinking and nobody was thinking what I was thinking. But uh, one of the cool things, right when we walked into the soy sauce place and they took us into the dining room to eat, there was these little pots off in the corner of the table and they had uh, a candle underneath them or like, you know, like a lighter. And inside the pot was soy milk and they had like a little liquid that they would add to it to make the soy milk uh, coagulate and set. So as soon as you walked in, you sat down, waiters, they come up to the table and they would light the little candles and then they would tell you, don't open it, don't touch it, leave it alone. And then in about 10 minutes, they would come, they would unveil it and it was perfectly set, warm, made at the table tofu. And then they would just mark it with a little bit of their soy sauce and just the warm, fresh tofu made with that beautiful soy milk with that soy sauce was just mind blowing. So then I thought how cool it would be is if you did the, the hot tofu with cold fish so if you did like ribbons of hamachi over the top with blistered tomatoes that you marinated in bonito and these kind of things, and you built a salad over the top, how amazing that would be. So then when I got back to Odium, I ordered these little pots from a, a store down the street where we would make the tofu at the table. And so we would light it and we'd make the tofu. And then while it was made, then we would bring another plate over to the table that had the ribbons of the fish, the vegetables, the, all the things. And then we would build it over the top and then top it with smoked soy sauce. And it was a beautiful dish. That 
is amazing. So you've won several contests. You com- you've done a little competition. What are some of your other wins? Uh, I won Grand Cochon uh, last year, which is a pig competition where they give you a whole pig and you can do whatever you want. Um, and it was a little more strict for Grand, but for LA, they told me I could do whatever I want. So I did five dishes utilizing the entire pig. And the challenge was to be able to feed 2,000 people with one pig. And so I did a lot of things. And one I was proud of is I found a way to feed 2,000 people one pig's head. And so I did a head cheese by filling little half sphere molds. And so I cooked everything separately and then diced everything separately and then took the head and made consomme and then spiked it with uh, Pedro Jimenez vinegar and then suspended everything with gelatin and then set them in these little half sphere molds. And then when I popped them out, did a little like persiad and mustard on the underneath it to eat like a charcuterie bite. So I think, I think when I went to LA, it was just showing a lot of technique and just utilization of the product and, and showcasing the farmer and the pig and where it came from. And then grand when I won was a lot more difficult because I had the same amount of people, but a hundred pounds less pig. Um, so that was very difficult and I had to use every single part of the pig, but it came out very, very nice. And since they said I could only do three dishes, I decided to pair each dish with a different beer. Uh, every, everybody wanted to pair, you know, their dishes with wine or, or, you know, like a Corona or something like that. But I thought it would be funny and cool to cross them both. So I did ciders or sours. And then I wanted to showcase the city I was in, where I was coming from and my background. So I did a French beer. I did a Los Angeles beer. And then I did a beer from Chicago with each dish. Very cool. Okay. So one of your takeaways from last year was becoming an Aura King ambassador. And there was a very, very special fish that you got to showcase as a result of having that distinction. Tell me about that fish and that event. That fish is amazing. The fish is called Thai salmon, and I try to get one a month. I tell them I want one a month, but they're very rare, and we got to share, so I get one like every other month. But it's if you thought a working salmon was the Wagyu of salmon, this is even better than that. It's a 30-pound fish or more, so it looks like a small pig. So every time I get it, I treat it like a pig, like I did with Koshan. I use different parts of it for different things. Um, but when I got presented to, to, to showcase this fish for the West Coast, um, they told me that the people they were going to invite were going to be chefs from all around the city. Um, they were also going to invite the fish purveyors since these were going to be their main suppliers. Um, and so when they said that, I thought to myself, oh, so you're inviting chefs in the city. Well, those are multiple different cuisines. There's Mexican chefs, there's French chefs, there's Italian chefs. There's... So I did a different cuisine with different parts of the fish. Um, I did a chicharron taco with the skin for Mexican. I did a salmon blanquette with the loin for French. I took the shank and did a, uh, an asabuco with bagna cotta and fried Parmesan chips for the Italian. I did, I took the bones and the head and I did a uh, fish head soup for Korean for, or for Asian, uh, you know, for Korean. And then for Japanese, I did, uh, I took all the belly and the toro and I did a sashimi with like Tokyo negi and beach mushrooms and then like a nago glaze and then did it over the top of an ice block that also had the salmon presented. Jonathan, you are a freaking rock star. Why are you a chef? How did all of this begin? Uh, my mother, I could say. I'm the youngest of six. So while all my siblings were out doing sibling things, I was left at home because I was the youngest. So I just hung out with mom, hence why I'm a mama's boy. So laundry, all those kinds of things come second nature. <laughs> so did you cook with mom? I did. And uh, my background is Colombian and Irish. My mom is Irish. But she took after my dad and his mother, my grandmother, with Colombian cooking. So growing up, she made a lot of Colombian food. So kind of, I think, sparked the, the creative culinary drive. And where was this growing up happening? Orlando, Florida, unfortunately. <laughs> I have to say unfortunately. No, I, I, well, you know, the land of the mouse. So t- t- tell us why, uh, why you qualify Orlando with unfortunately. Uh, they're mass chain restaurants. And especially when I was 18, there wasn't really many artisanal restaurants or, or chef driven restaurants or people that came there to open restaurants. It was more just 
fast food, Olive Garden, Chili's, Outback, which don't get me wrong, I still love. There's nothing wrong with that every once in a while. I, you know, I'll go hide out there in a the corner by myself sometimes. But. Okay, so, you know, you're 18 years old. Why did you decide to choose a life in food? When did you start working professionally? What was your first restaurant job? Uh, I decided to move. Uh, I, I decided to cook probably when I was 14. I knew once I once I found out the term culinary arts and what that meant, then that's when I knew I wanted to do that. Uh, I went to Le Cordon Bleu in, in, in Orlando just to check it out, but I didn't like it that much. And I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Atlanta that offered me a place to stay and to go to culinary school. So I moved out there to go to culinary school. And then from there, I met a chef that had worked for Thomas Keller and Eric Repair and Daniel Balloud and all these chefs in the early 90s. And so he was my ticket into the French Laundry. And, and who was that chef? How did you meet him? His name was Pano, Pano uh, Caratosis, and he was the chef de cuisine of a Buckhead Life group in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, he became very fond of me just because of my passion and drive. And uh, after I proved myself to him for after two years, he had made the phone call to Thomas, which had Corey Lee call me to set up the stage at the French Laundry. And I was 20 years old at this point. Well, that's kind of a charmed thing to have happen. So you must have been terrified. And I imagine, had you ever been to Northern California or California at all? Tell me about that first experience with Thomas Keller. That was, uh, I had never been anywhere besides Atlanta at this point. So Florida and Atlanta. So even just going out there to hang out at the French Laundry was my first time out uh, on the West Coast. Um, and then I remember I, 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 wrote, uh, I got there a day early and I went to the French Laundry, decided to circle the property and look around. And it was just very, very, very intimidating. And I was very, it just actually made my nerves even worse. <laughs> like I didn't sleep that night probably because of that. Um, and then I actually didn't get the chance to meet Thomas Keller when I staged because he was out of town because he travels a lot. But nonetheless, I got the experience for sure. And so how long was the stage? And then eventually you get a job there? Mm -hmm. The stage I did was a, only a week. And I was told by Corey Lee that the stages had to last three months. And that was just a tryout to see if you could get the job. So he made an exception because of the recommendation I had from the chef in Atlanta. Um, but I didn't get the job right away. So after my week of staging, I had to do a tasting. And again, I'm 20 years old, working for some chef, my first chef, and still in culinary school, so I knew nothing. And he hit me with rabbit for three, <laughs> rack, kidney, loin. I mean, of course he would. It's, you know, it's a high caliber restaurant, you know, they expect a lot. And I failed the tasting, obviously, but he liked something in me, saw something in me, so he offered me a job at Bouchon, in which I took later. And then I would use one of my two days off every week for a year and a half uh, to stage at the French Laundry to get my foot into the door. And that's how I got into the French Laundry. Tell me how that goes. So you get in the French Laundry. Where do you start? What's the position? Tell me about what that early, early time was like actually working there. It must have been pretty thrilling. Did you pinch yourself every morning? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was more uh, the sous chef pinching me in the morning. <laughs> but... Uh, Yes, it was it was very, very, very exciting and almost felt surreal. Like, wow, I actually did it. I moved across the country by myself. I'm here. I did what I said I was going to do. I can't believe I'm here, but it wasn't easy nonetheless. But I started as a me, as everybody does. And usually you're a me for about a year before you even move to a station. And when the first station you move to is cheese. And then from there, based off of your talent, they place you in different areas of the kitchen. For people listening who might not know what that means to be a Comey, what does that job entail? A Comey is basically a prep cook. So you do all of the... It's a very, very, very important job. The restaurant cannot run without Comeys uh, or prep cooks. So they do all the receiving. They do all the like the oyster shucking, the cleaning of the fish, the produce receiving, the putting things away, the shucking of the peas, the juicing, the all the all the little things that the chefs or the chef de parties, the line cooks, uh, wouldn't have enough time to do. And during that time, you must have had some terrifying mistakes that scared you. It's just inevitable. Tell me about some of the times that there was a big oops in the, ki in the kitchen that you were responsible for. <laughs> that's, that's <m> <laughs> well, one, uh, 
one when I was a Comey, one of the first ones was I received a FedEx box. Now, it may seem simple and not like nothing to some people, but I received and signed for a FedEx box that apparently we weren't not supposed to receive. So I didn't check the order guide uh, that was hanging on the wall saying when we were supposed to re receive this particular box. And so I received it. And so I almost got let go for that just for receiving a box. What was in it, for goodness sake? It was seafood. And since the French Laundry is on a strict schedule and everything's mapped out, Monday's this thing, Tuesday's this thing, Thursday's this thing, whatever, um, receiving that box a day early kind of threw everything off schedule. And so it was actually a big deal. Yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> but you kept the job. Yeah. How long did you stay at the French Laundry altogether? Six years. That's quite something. So in essence... Your job here at OTM, you're still very, very new in your restaurant work experience, in essence, in years at least. Absolutely, 100%. But luckily, I have a good mentor, Chef Timothy Hollingsworth, that kind of shows me along the way. So, How did you and Timothy meet? At the French Laundry. When I got the job there, finally, this was after the staging and working at Bouchon, and he became Chef de Cuisine after Corey Lee. Uh, I worked with him for four years at the French Laundry. And the first couple of years were a little rough, but this was just, you know, testing how good I was and kind of pushing me to see how much I could handle. And once he found out that I could and that I wouldn't give up and that I could actually cook, uh, we ended up cooking very well together. And then when he had this project, Otium, presented to himself and he was looking to start hiring his crew, he had called me about the Chef de Cuisine position. Tell us what an average day, and I know that that is a crazy term to use when we talk about the French Laundry, because there couldn't be a simple thing that's average about it, but tell me what your average day was like. What time did it begin? What time did it end? And how did an average work day there go for you? So I would say Average would probably be when I first started now looking back on it and how my skill level has advanced since then So average would be we would get there around 4 45 a.m. In the morning um, We would get there. We would put the the trash bags in the trash bins We would fill up the salt on the lines We would fold the towels and put them on the stations for the chefs to come in later We would turn on the flat tops turn on the ovens kind of get the restaurant going, you know, kind of giving it a heartbeat in the morning um and then from then, I would go through and I would check all the produce. I would check all the orders, make sure everything was ordered, make sure the list that the chefs wrote for us to do matched with the produce that was coming in because the menu changed every day. So we had to make sure that everything was ordered. Um, and then from there, I would write my labels for everything to make it go quicker. Then I would make all the cornets. Then after I made the cornets, then I would go into oyster trimming. After doing all the shucking and trimming of my oysters, then we would go into making family meal, which is around 12 o'clock. Then after family meal, I would go into knife work, whether it was brunoise or things like that. Um, and then from there, then we would go into inventorying all the produce again, then deep cleaning the room, scrubbing the floors, wiping the walls, cleaning the ovens, the flat tops, everything, and then leaving. At some point during those years, undoubtedly, Chef Keller got to know you and you got to know him. Tell me about how that relationship developed and how you regard that experience. I love Thomas Keller. He's amazing. He's one of the hardest working people I've ever seen in my life. Every time he was in town, he went to every single one of his restaurants. He was always there. He shook everybody's hand. Uh, he, uh, when I was at the French Laundry, he would show up for family meal every day at 12 o'clock when he was in town. Um, and he would eat family meal. He would talk to everybody. He would go around. He would taste things. But then he would make his way through the, you know, the restaurants. But obviously, French Laundry being his baby, he would end there. And right when service would start is when he would be there and he'd have his apron on and everything. And he would be wiping the windows. He'd be in dish, helping send plates through the dish machine, watching the first dishes go out. Then he would, you know, leave, go do his thing, come back, close the restaurant down, wiping the windows in the office. Like it was it was his home. It was awesome. And. And seeing somebody that doesn't have to do that, that has that big of a name, but still does it because they love it, is very inspirational. What would you say that you took with you when you left the French Laundry? In your mind and in your heart, what remains with you today as a chef? 
That's a hard question. I took so much from that restaurant. Everything. I mean, I took, I guess, relationships with, with other chefs. Like, so many, so many people from around the world came to work there. And so I, I know a lot of, like, friends and colleagues and, like, and line cooks I work next to that are living in England, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Like, they're all over. And so it's like to have that connection with friends all over the world is very amazing and then you still trade secrets you still trade recipes you still talk they come into town you take them out and i mean but besides the technique and flavor profiles and just eyes wide open i mean the relationships created were awesome so you leave the french laundry and you come to los angeles to work on this new project um tell me what it was like coming here to otium as the opening chef de cuisine Working here with your mentor, Timothy Hollingsworth, tell me about how that was in the first day. It was amazing. Um, very, very, very nerve wracking. Honestly, felt like back at the French Laundry, like nerves, like those kinds of butterflies. Um, but I'm so glad that I did it. And I'm so glad that I came down here because it really evolved me as a chef. It took me from a line cook into a chef. Um, and again, I had never been a manager at any restaurant before this point. I've never been a sous chef at any restaurant before this point. I went straight from a line cook at the French Laundry to Chef de Cuisine at Odium. And thank Tim for actually believing that I could do it because I didn't know if I could at the beginning because I didn't know anything. But with his guidance and everything, I mean, I am where I am today. But I mean, it, it's pretty amazing working with such an amazing chef, Timothy Hollingsworth, and everything that he did for me in the restaurant. It's, it's incredible. Well, you know, management in a restaurant, in the kitchen and the front of the house, it all starts at the top. So how do you manage? What do you do to make sure that this is a happy and a healthy workplace? Because I must say, there sure is a happy vibe in here. So what are you doing, Jonathan, to both create and nurture that? Showing the entire staff that I actually care about them and that they're not just a, an employee. Gaining respect from everybody was definitely hard, as you can imagine. If any, any, in any restaurant, when they change chef de cuisines or anything, a lot of the staff leaves. And when everybody got hired here, um, you know, they were under the impression that uh, they were going to be with Chef Timothy Hollingsworth more than they were for me. But as any chef de cuisine, you work with the chef de cuisine a little more. And so I had to prove myself. And I had to pull out a lot of tricks that I had learned at the French Laundry to kind of gain respect. And then once I gained that respect, then I showed them that I respected them. And this place, I'm trying, I mean, Tim and I are both, it's, it's, not, it's not a, we're not trying to train cooks. We're trying to breed chefs. Um, and by showing these cooks that and showing them the program that we're trying to develop here, like the raw bar, from the raw bar to the garmage, to the wood oven, to the pasta, to the saute, to the grill, there are so many different cooking techniques. And the, the, the raw bar, the cooks break down the fish. I don't break down the fish. The sous chefs don't break down the fish. We teach them to break down the fish. They're responsible for breaking down the fish. They're responsible for the inventory for the fish. They come to me at the end of the night and we do the order together so they learn how to order. The garmage, there's like five different cooking techniques. There's frying, there's sauteing, there's baking, there's a funnel cake, there's octopus, there's tartare. There's so many different things there's a, 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 on that station and then wood oven. Not a lot of cooks know how to work with real wood or have ever worked with a wood oven. So, you know, we pick up vegetables, razor clams, I mean, chicken, anything out of that wood oven that you think would be good. And then you move over to pasta, you learn how to glaze. Now, I mean, even Thomas Keller said, I, I read recently, um, that even professional chefs have a hard time glazing things. And so putting them on that station and showing them how to glaze pasta pr properly, you use that technique then when you move over to saute, how to glaze vegetables. There's basting of crepinettes, there's quail, there's squab, there's uh, confit, there's saute, there's all kinds of different cooking techniques on saute. And then you move over to grill and there's nothing sous vide. And Odium being a sharing kind of style restaurant, we do three and a half pound tomahawks that we cook from raw when they're ordered in cowboy ribeyes uh new york steaks kansas city steaks uh we do whole roasted vegetables i mean everything on that grill whole fish we hang them from racks above the grill we'll put vegetables above the grill and then use them the next day on the steak sets and the steak sets change every day and the cooks are responsible for those 
Then after the cooks make it through all those stations, we then take them to the morning where I teach them how to butcher, where the butcher program is. Then I teach them how to butcher meat. Then from there, they move over to posture production. So the idea is in within two years, they have learned every kind of basic cooking technique, but at a, uh, at a better skill level, giving these cooks the, the opportunity to learn from people that have come from the French Laundry and maybe they not, may not be able to go there. Uh, a lot of cooks have their family here, just can't afford to move across the, you know, to Northern California. And so giving them that experience in L.A. and then uh, the relationship, like I mentioned before, to send them anywhere they want if they can is pretty amazing. Like we have a couple of chefs that, well, one of them is about to go to Mexico. Uh, one of them wants to go work for Alain Ducasse in France. So Chef Tim is going to set that up. So it's just one of the things that you go through, you train, we teach you, you, we're humble, you're humble, and then we send you off to go accomplish your dreams. With both you and Chef Timothy Hollingsworth coming from the French Laundry, obviously there are similarities in technique, in standards, and that sort of thing. What would you say is the taste of Otium that you all have developed. What is, is there a signature dish here? What's the taste? There's a few signature dishes. Um, <laughs> I, I guess you could say the taste maybe comes from uh, Chef Tim's wife is Middle Eastern. And I know that had a big influence on, on his culinary career when he first moved to L.A., and right when they got engaged, I mean, he was immersed into a whole different world of cuisine that he had never really gotten to do before. I mean, we've done falafel, but I mean, we've learned a lot of different cooking techniques. And what was very special is a lot of people that leave the French Laundry still do French Laundry food. They don't know how to cook anything else. So it was very cool to see us open this place and do nothing that was similar to the French Laundry. And I mean, we had multiple cuisines on the menu and sure we had some French things, but it was never anything that we did at the French Laundry. So Taste of Odium, what I I'd definitely say, I mean, there's multiple cuisines, but I mean, I know Jonathan Gold actually put it best. He said that uh, Odium is um, almost like we're trying to reinvent like how Americans eat every day. I mean, you think about it, you wake up, you have Let's say a breakfast burrito and then for lunch you have a pizza and then at night you have Italian or, or like a sushi or something like that. Our menu, it kind of looks like that. There's Japanese dishes, Middle Eastern dishes, Italian, French, Spanish, Mexican. It's, it's all over the place. I mean, Odium is kind of very ethnic. What are, your, what are your life goals? I mean, shoot, you keep kind of hitting the mark at a pretty early age. How old are you? 32. So where do you envision yourself in 10 years? How about that stretch? In 10 years, hopefully still cooking. Hopefully still cooking? Hopefully. What do you think's going to happen? Well, no, I say hopefully because I, uh, as, you, as you grow in the industry and as you open more places and restaurants, you kind of get pulled away from that. And it becomes more business aspect, more paperwork, more mentoring. I mean, I mean mentoring is part of the cooking, but I just I, I want to make sure I still schedule myself to be in the kitchen. I mean, when, when we start expanding, Tim and I. Uh, so in 10 years, hopefully I see myself running multiple properties and still scheduling myself to cook on the line from now and then. So yes, I'd like to be 42 and still cooking on the line. <laughs> <laughs> and what does the kitchen, what does the work in that kitchen, what does it give you? <sighs> Happiness, to be completely honest, happy. I'm completely at home and comfortable in, in, in when I start cooking. Uh, there's no place I'd rather be than cooking. And it's, it's kind of where I go to escape too. Like if, if I'm having problems or anything's bad or wrong, I mean, cooking, I have uh, a glass of wine, Frank Sinatra and cooking can kind of just block anything out to be honest. <laughs> well, Jonathan, this has been an honor and a pleasure. And I can't wait to see where you're going to be in 10 years. Cause I'm going to be keeping an eye on you. Is that a deal? hundred <laughs> percent. I hope we're best friends now because otherwise I'm going to be pretty upset. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. It's a done deal. Thank you very much. That was Jonathan Granada at Otium in downtown Los Angeles. If you enjoyed today's show, you'll want to catch up with the two previous contestants, Chef Maya Lee and Chef Yael Pete. 
You'll find both of those quick bites on our podcast feed at poppytooker.com. And don't miss the big reveal when we announce the winner in an upcoming broadcast of Louisiana Eats. You can learn more about Aura King's amazing salmon and fantastic story by visiting their website, auraKingsalmon.co.nz. You'll find a link in today's show notes. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you won't miss a delicious serving of Louisiana Eats. Visit poppytooker.com for lots more recipes and delicious food ideas, too. Louisiana Eats original theme music composed by David Pomerlo and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Thanks to Sarah Holtz, who produced this podcast, and Maddie Mulladu, our social media maven. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, too. I'm Poppy Tooker. Thanks for listening, and thanks to our major sponsors, Camellia Brand, Satarans, and Rouse's Markets. Visit poppytooker.com to see a full list of our partners. This Louisiana Eats Quick Bite was produced by Poppy Tooker Broadcasting.